Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Playful Humans podcast. I'm your host, Mike Montague. You can find Playful Humans at playfulhumans.com. Hit like, hit subscribe for the podcast, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube. My guest this week is a television and feature film writer and voiceover talent. His name is Chris Warner. Hey, Chris. Hey. Find him at thechriswarner.com and check out his latest movie. It's Willie's Wonderland. It is a great creepy film the trailer on youtube was amazing i can't wait to watch the whole thing willie's wonderland uh was released on february 12th and uh the chris warner.com here we go Chris, we like to start the show with uh, the joke of the week. The joke of the week is brought to you by pizza. I could tell you a joke about pizza, but it's a little cheesy. Uh, try pizza today. Uh, now, here's the, here's the official joke uh, with your friends. I like this one. To whoever stole my Microsoft Office, I will find you. You have my word. And Excel and PowerPoint. Oh, All right, there we go. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Chris. Uh, tell everybody a little bit about what you do for a living and and uh, how you play. What uh, what kind of playful career you have? Well, uh, I'll actually start the show with uh, my joke of the week. And it's not necessarily a joke, but a funny moment. My wife and I were uh, grabbing lunch the other day and we're sitting at a light. And we kind of had to maneuver around some, some construction workers and the gentlemen were taking their time, let's put it that way. And we were sitting there, and I was just listening to the music, and I thought, hey, they got the slow vid. <laughs> <laughs> there is definitely some services around the country that have slow vid, uh, for sure. So I just made myself laugh there out loud for some <laughs> stupid reason, but that was a, you know, a little fun moment. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of... Uh, there's lots of businesses right now, for sure, that can uh, relate to that. I love it. Uh, so... Writing and voiceover acting, how did you get into it? You know what? Um, I've always been a fan of movies, and um, I was not a thespian as a child. I was Santa Claus in the fifth grade, and I was Santa Claus in the twelfth grade, and those just happened to be wow. kind of classed productions. They weren't part of the, uh, the, the, the theater arts group, so to speak, but I've always loved movies, probably from the time I can remember, uh, all the way back to Probably my fondest, fondest first memory of a movie was Rocky. Rocky and Star Wars were my big uh, big anchors to start with. I actually have a Rocky poster right here on the wall next to me for inspiration. And uh, I've written a screenplay, actually, an MMA screenplay that pays homage to that. But how did I get into it? Well, I've probably done uh, 57 different jobs in my life. Sometimes I had three jobs at one time. I was going to school out of high school to be I started in finance, but I quickly switched. I was going to be a physical therapist. I took a lot of biology, kinesiology, et cetera. Uh, and about the time I was about to go to physical therapy school, they had changed some rules on how they were going to reimburse. The government was going to reimburse. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, I know I'm going to get rich, but I'm going to have to work two jobs like these, these therapists I work with who had master's degrees for seven days a week and make yeah, 80 grand a year, let's say. I, which I'm not sneezing at, but it's like, wow, okay. Um, and about that time, I literally had lunch uh, with one of the occupational therapists I work with, and we were talking over a movie because she was a movie fan too. And um, and I just told her I went to this movie over the weekend and said, hey, I, that can't be that hard. Now, I've always been a cut up and a smart ass. So I think learning to be a focused cut up and smart ass is something that happened real quick. And so she was fans with actors and I started hanging out with her and wow. one thing led to another and I started taking classes and all this happened back in Austin, Texas. I'm from Texas originally. So, and that was when I was, uh, it, was it was a while back. It was a couple of decades ago and it just, it's the only thing I do now of all the jobs I've worked and the things I want to do that time literally does stand still for me. I don't look at the clock when I'm on set. I don't look at the clock when I'm at the, at the computer writing. Uh, it truly is something that, that fulfills a purpose. I, I it, it's got to be my purpose in life is to entertain people and chase crazy. That's that's what I do. Well, yeah, I, I love that. And that's the whole point for me, too. I love public speaking when the cameras are on, a lot of microphones on. 
um, you have to be present. You have to be in that flow state and paying attention because you can't be distracted and, and doing this thing at the same time. I think even writing uh, too is a really easy flow state to fall into when you get in a, a groove. But um, for people that don't know you, you've been in a lot of stuff and done a, a lot of jobs. Are there any highlights you're proud of or maybe that, that people have seen? I know some of the, the movie titles are recognizable for sure. Sure. Um, my first big role, if you want to call it that, was uh, in a small independent movie back in 1980 or 1998 with uh, uh, Pop, P- Guy Pierce was called A Slipping Down Life. And that was back in Texas. Mm-hmm. But my my biggest claims to fame is I was in the uh, movie No Country for Old Men that won the Academy Award opposite Tommy Lee Jones. And another one was uh, Sin City, Frank Miller Sin City, which kind of broke ground on some some very visual things that uh, people use now. And then uh, my latest movie was opposite uh, a lot of people's kind of um, closeted favorite, Nick Cage, which was a, a fun mm-hmm. role because I won't give away one of the spoilers, but his character is a very interesting character based on one characteristic. And I won't tell you what it is because it's very interesting, but it was a fun role to play. Uh, it's probably the most fun I've had on set because the way I put it is I got to play in the entire sandbox. The, mm. Kevin Lewis is a great guy. He's a he, he's really easy to work with. And he just said, hey, Chris, I love the essence that you brought to this. Go play. And he let me play. It was, it was a hell of a good time on set on Willie's Wonderland. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, check out Willie's Wonderland for sure. It's it's already out, so uh, go look it up. Start with the, the trailer on YouTube if you like that kind of thing. If you don't want any spoilers whatsoever, I would say a horror flick is the genre, right? If you're into horror, just find yeah. Willie's Wonderland and watch it. That way you don't get any of the, the spoilers for it. But sure. super cool uh, thing. And I guess your style is sort of the the bad guy or the the villain in a lot of things right how does uh how does that work out for you and is that more fun or less fun to play than straight roles you know you get around most actors and they'll tell you that the villain is the most fun to play and i can't disagree um i mean i'm a fairly large dude and i kind of have that brooding darkness to me and i never you you will never question how the world perceives you if you're an actor. And what I mean by that is there's some things I thought about myself that I never thought of before I became an actor. And one of the things is just kind of, you know, the way my wife puts it, I'm I'm a hard outer shell with a soft gooey center. You know, I'm a big teddy bear. And and I I generally am. Of course, you can push some buttons, don't get me wrong, but Mm -hmm. um, that's what most people could see. But when you first, when you put me on screen and you look at me without me opening my mouth at all, it's, there, there is a presence there that I didn't realize until I became an actor. And so heavies, uh, bad guys, cops, um, prisoners, those kind of things I play. And those guys tend to fall into the uh, the, the wrong side of hell, if that makes sense. <laughs> Which, again, you do get – the shackles do get taken off artistically, and you do kind of get to, to, to be around everything. And you get to marinate it in the whole story where sometimes you're – your heroes are on a path to save the world and they have to say squeaky clean and pure in thought and all this stuff, this stuff. And then Frank Castle comes along and he has no rules, which again, if, if you enjoy improv, which I do, and I love when a, a director allows me off the page a little bit, it, you and the other actors start to, to, to engage each other organically and it's just a good time, man. Yeah, I, I guess there there's so much to, to dive into here. Hopefully we can talk about different parts of it that are, are interesting for you. But I wanted to pivot a little bit and ask you about voiceover talent because I've done a little bit from radio, mostly commercials and, and paying gig stuff. But when did that come a, about? And I feel like that's a fun job that most people would like. Well, most people hate the sound of their voice, actually. But once you get over that, that's got to be a pretty easy, fun gig because you can explore more of the canvas there. And then you don't get stereotyped. You could be playing anybody in a a voiceover thing. Uh, So how did that come about for you? And how do you feel about that versus uh, on-screen acting? Um, A voiceover I've done from the beginning. uh, When I I began my career, I was more focused on on on-camera stuff. So every once in a while, a voiceover opportunity would come along. And it is a process. It once you learn the process and the technical parts of it and how sometimes you have to, you know, you have to, there's some technical aspects of it as far as timing and stuff you have to learn. 
Um, once that's there, you, you, you're right, you can take off the gloves and the sandbox becomes even bigger because now you're not focused on your, your physical aesthetics. Nobody's looking at you. You can wear pajamas or shorts or they joke about that to work because all you have to do, all you have to use is your voice to convince. Now, on the flip side of that, that can be harder too because you have to be very convincing in the tone and flexion and reverberation and all this stuff of your voice. So as I, probably in the last five years, I really got uh, really hyper-focused on my voiceover career, started taking some coaching with different folks, started hanging out with some professional voiceover actors and getting a feel for how that is, is different than on camera. And it is, that community is a different community than the on camera community, even though you have people going back and forth. If you see behind me, this big black box behind me, that's actually my studio um, that I use. And, and it's, when you step in, there's a, there's a switch that flips, just like when you step mm -hmm. on set and everybody says lock set, uh, you know, action, Again, you're locking into a different zone. And when you're in there, the sandbox, that's like a TARDIS to me. <laughs> and that when you step in, it becomes whatever you want it to be, really. And then it, 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 the, the playground is, is whatever you paint. And so um, what you come to find out when you do step into the land of voiceover, if you're going to do it as a professional or even if you want to do it as a hobby, voiceover has so many different paths you can follow as compared to on camera. I mean, on camera, you can be in a commercial, you can be on TV, or you can be in a movie. With voiceover, you can put your movie on a commercial, you can put your movie in a video game, you can put your movie on a um, uh, on an e-learning site, you can put it over a whiteboard oh, yeah. teaching, you can put it on documentaries as a, as a narrator, you can do audio books. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a plethora of things. You can be on a PBX as, hey, uh, hit one for, so a lot of times people will hire their, their, sometimes they'll use the employees to do that, but bigger corporations tend to hire professional voiceover actors. So they want a crisp, clean product because they're going around the world with it. So um, yeah, the voiceover is, a, is, a, is kind of like on camera, but a little different, but, but the sandbox is just the same. Once you say action or once you hit record, get after it with reckless abandon. That's what I do. And, and here's the thing, with recording in this studio, if I don't like the last take, guess what I'll do? I'll just do it again. But That's the cool also, thing about doing your own voiceover is, is you don't have, you're the own director, so you can take as many yeah. cuts as you want and spend as long as you want on it, right? That's cool. Yeah, and now with COVID, th there's hardly anybody going into any any recording studio or booth now. You, if you don't have your own booth at home, you're not going to be much of a professional voiceover artist. And you're right. It's going to be a lot of self-direction. With self-tape comes self-direction. Now, you may do, uh, you may get on a, a you know, a, a dedicated line with the director if you get the, the gig and they direct you. But usually they'll just say, hey, do three to five takes. And of course, do them differently. And, and you send them in and they'll pick one or they'll, they'll kind of cobble them together and presto, change -o. You got the Ford F-150 commercial or... So, so yeah, yeah well, it's, it's that's amazing. the thing I love about audio is the editing too. You just hit on something really powerful. There is, it could be two parts of the same sentence or two, you know, <laughs> two different takes, but, but, and two different parts of the same sentence that you can cut together or you cut out ums and ahs or an awkward mm -hmm. pause that was held too long or, or anything. You got a lot more flexibility in audio because you don't have to worry about the camera cuts or anything <laughs> making sense. You can edit one sentence 10 times if you wanted to, right? That's kind of cool. Oh, absolutely. It, and it's, it, it's cool pulling the professional side, but sometimes when you do something, it, it, I'll, do a, I'll do a basic edit when I'm done before I send it out, the ums, the ahs, the pops, the clicks. And, and sometimes I'll hit a point where it, it seems like it should change, but the organic sense that you get out of it, the feel, the, you know what? No, 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 that, that mistake, quote, that actually needs to stay in there because it gives it so much life that people will get it. They'll, they'll forgive the mistake because they'll relate so much to it. So that's what I do on camera too. When I F up on camera, you never want to cut yourself. And if you're good enough, and if you, if you're, and I say good enough, but if you've practiced and if you come game ready, you'll turn that mistake into something amazing because now your energy levels are through the roof and you will go hunt and find your way very quickly to get back to where you need to be in the path of things. So that's amazing. And by the way, you get two points for the Doctor Who TARDIS reference. So uh, two <laughs> points, two to zero. Nicely done. Um, I wanted to ask you, you seem to be a person who's driven and has a lot of passion. What, what, where did that come from for you? Have you always played for a living? Sounds like you started this pretty early and found out what you wanted to do. And, and then 
uh, sounds like you're also very goal driven and, and very active. You're not waiting for opportunities. Where did your life philosophy come about and, and how do you define success for yourself? Um, to try to compress it very quickly, it probably was two, two tiered. One was from my mother, my mom, um, her and my dad met in the army and she was just a go getter. Uh, she left a small town in Virginia, Southwest Virginia and, and went out to live life. She went, she was in the army. She got out, she came back. She got two degrees uh, in English and journalism. And then she just went, she just, my mom did what she wanted to do. Uh, and, and, and not in a, she wasn't an aggressive person. Like get off me, I'm going to do what I want to do. She just went and did it. And, and more than anything, what I learned from her is not really how she sat down and taught me a lesson with words. It's I just observed how she lived her life and it became ingrained in my DNA. So it, I don't, I can't tell you where it started, probably back to where I can't even remember, is I just knew that I was going to move through life the way I wanted to, because probably I watched my mother do that. And then what reinforced that was, I, I mean, you, you're right, I, I'm a pretty, fairly competitive guy and I played a lot of competitive sports, played Texas high school football, which it's true, it is a religion. And when you get around coaches and, and minds like that, that drive you, it can't help become, but become part of your DNA as well. So with my mother laying the foundation and my coaches kind of building the bricks on top of it, this is what was made, so to speak. And then I continue to, to, to try to evolve as an adult by staying on the edge of the cusp and the edge by getting coaching on a regular basis, no matter what it's in. It could be voiceover, on-camera acting, yeah. trying to figure out how to market myself better, how to build my brand, whatever it may be, trying to find the best folks who know how to do that and then learn from them as best I can, whether they're saying how to do it or showing how to do it. I, I try to keep the edge as sharp as possible all the time. I think that that's great. And I want to dive more into that, but I wanted to second what you said. I think people that I find play for a living don't like to waste a lot of time. It sounds like <laughs> you're, you're trying to move through life, take advantage of stuff, make the most of it and not just sit around and watch Netflix for, for the weekend and, and waste the whole thing and trying to make the most of it and take advantage of life is really cool. And, and I think uh, investing in yourself is tough. So I'm wondering what your thought is around people that are getting started. Uh, it sounds like maybe you're, uh, you're in a place here where you can afford to invest in yourself and it's not as big of a risk as it is early in your career. How do you make decisions like that uh, when it's kind of your own business and your own career how much of your own money to reinvest and how much of it, you know, you need to keep to, to keep things going and stuff. Um, you know, it's funny when you said this, I was thinking one way. And then by the time you got done with your question, I was thinking another, uh, when I was in college, I went back and spoke to some of the kids at my high school through my mother. She was the high school teacher at the high school I taught at. And, uh, and I remember speaking to him in a bigger crowd, probably two, two, 300 kids. And one kid stood up and he said, well, how do you, how do you follow your dream when you, when you don't have, when your parents don't believe in you or your parents don't support you? And I've been fortunate enough to have people in my life that do support me. Now, my parents don't necessarily understand my acting career because my mom was a high school teacher and my dad was in the military, but they wanted the best for me. And my answer there was, and it was, it was, it was simple, but never, not necessarily easy. It's put yourself around people, not necessarily the ones that love you, who support your goal. That's, that's one. And that's, that doesn't necessarily take any money. It's not necessarily shill shilling out anything monetarily. It's just getting around people and groups of people. And I don't want to say like-mindedness. I want to say are as savage in the soul as you are about what you want to do. Because I've been around people that are like-minded, but they do not have the savagery with which I want and, and like to pursue my goals with. And it could be one person. It could be a group. So getting around those groups is just a manner of researching what you want to do and people you do who do it and do it well. And then the monetizing part is just that. You have to sit down and ask yourself, how important is the thing I want to move toward to me? If it's 100%, then you put 100% of your discretionary funds toward that goal. The end. I can't, it's, hmm. it's that simple. It's not easy. I understand 100%, especially as a younger person. I know. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. Look at it and say, okay, it's 100% what I want to do, but 25% I want to be a young person. Well, cool. Take your discretionary income, take 25% away from it, do what you want to do with it, have fun with it, and then take the other 75 and invest. I don't care if it's $10. $10 could buy you 
you know, a, a downloadable video of somebody yeah, who you book. admire yeah. or a great book. That's a start. Sure. You, you won't be able to put thousands of dollars into it like I have and, and still do, but it's proportional. Mm -hmm. Just because you have a little doesn't mean you can't move forward a lot. Seriously, listen to what I just said. Just because you have a little doesn't mean you can't move forward a lot. Because all it is is grit. Grit. I can't, I can't qualify or quantify that for you. It is what it is for you. But if you, as they say, and it's cliche, if you want something bad enough, you'll figure out how to do it. You will. Yeah, and I wonder how you um, how you balance. So we, we've had a lot of discussions on this podcast about the difference between play and work or, or really having that grit and striving hard and grinding towards your goal versus having just play and passion and, and loving what you do and enjoying it. Because I think sometimes when you take a passion and you turn it into – a career, you can burn out on it. You're working too hard and you're not, you're forgetting to enjoy the ride. And sometimes the most fun you have in your career is early before you have success with it. You know, that's when you're meeting cool people and taking chances and you can afford to, to do crazy things, right? Do you have any stories around that or, or thoughts around how do you balance what you do for fun and what you do for work? Well, you know, you're right. A lot of your fun is, is at the beginning of your career because uh, in this case, ignorance is bliss. There's some things that you don't know. So you just, you know, reckless abandon toward it all and you're slinging mud and everything else. <laughs> then you come to find out when you get punched in the face a couple of times, you're like, oh, okay, maybe I won't open that door. Oh, yeah. And what's sad is if you're not building up this, this intestinal fortitude along the way by putting yourself around people who build you up, not lie to you, but build you up and support you, then those punches along the way will take their toll and you'll end up giving up. So, yeah. and you're right. If if you don't put yourself around these people and then play along the way, and I'm a culprit of this, I'll definitely let you know that. If you don't play along the way in things that fill your soul, then you're right. You'll burn out or you'll quit or you'll be angry through the process. And sometimes the things that you play at that you start, that you started with playing at at the beginning won't be the things that sustain you to the end. So whether it's your career or something you like to do, one thing I like to use an example real quick is motorcycles. You know, motorcycles are a questionable thing for some folks. Now, I was the kid who could ride his friend's motorcycle but never have one of my own. So what I unfortunately did is took that into my adulthood and because it was something that someone else didn't want me to do, it became something I didn't do as an adult for no reason. If you and I sit <laughs> right. down now and be like, why didn't you get money? Why haven't you purchased a motorcycle or learned how to ride a motorcycle? Huh. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. So again, I, I've been I've been using this term real quick and I'll, I'll wrap it up here, but I've been using this term lately is, and actually last year I would tell folks, hey, don't let the world's 2020 be your 2020. And by right. saying that, don't let someone's belief in anything, riding a motorcycle, skydiving, being an actor, being a voiceover artist, being an astronaut, whatever it is you want to be, put yourself around the people who know how to do it and do it on a daily basis and just only ask them how to do it. Yeah, you can't get rid of mom and dad. I get it and, and everything else. But if you build from what these other folks are telling you in the area of playfulness, I think that'll stick in your DNA a little bit longer than just moving toward a goal because someone said you should do it. I like that. And then I wanted to ask you a follow-up question on that about um, the projects that you choose. So I'm imagining when you're writing for television or feature film, you're writing what you want to write a lot of the times. And that's where you can express your creativity. But if you're performing as an actor live or, or voice, you're, perf you're fulfilling somebody else's creative vision for, for the most part. So how do you balance between jobs that pay and jobs that are fun? Or do you only try and find both? Or, or how does that, that balance shake out for you when it comes to choosing projects? Uh, I think as a writer, I, I, I've written enough now that I try to consider the commercial aspect when I'm writing. You know, a lot, you get around a lot of writers, people that coach writing stuff, they'll say, you know, write your story, write your story, write what you know. And most writers write what they know. Um, but I, I've gotten to the point that I've written so much, I do write with the commercial aspect in, in, in play. But you're still going to get no. You know, your playfulness is still going to get knocked down. 
you still have to know that your writing is good, which it is, you know, you'll come to a point when you won't even have to send it out to someone, although you should, but you'll know. I'll admit something the other day, I'm going to be extremely transparent here. I was rewriting a feature script I wrote 10 years ago, and I was doing a polished rewrite on it last week, and hell, I might get emotional right now, is I got to a point at the end when this character who's extremely flawed, and this is the one that pays homage to Rocky, I started to get emotional writing his dialogue. Hmm. And I'm looking at my wife and I'm like, what the hell am I doing? I was so connected to the character. And it wasn't me. It was definitely the character. But his dialogue, talking to his, his person who was supporting him, was so, so rich that it caused me to get emotional, which, though, is, for me, a playful area. So right. back to your question real quick. The writing, I work as as strongly as I can to what I want out into the world as a story can be. Now, as an actor, you're right. Things come across. I had an audition the other day. You know, it. it and you look at these characters, and, and that's where you have to understand how the world perceives you. Was I really this character? Well, someone saw enough of me in that character to say, yes, you are. So I've got to take the script, and I've got to break it down, literally word by word, and find out what they saw in not only the dialogue, but the narrative that made them see I could play this so I can give it back to them and hopefully get hired and, and collect a paycheck, but ultimately provide entertainment that keeps people on the edge of their seat. That's why I'm an actor. I want to inspire you to, when you leave whatever you're watching, I didn't turn to the camera and tell you this, but I move something in you so strong that you get up and go play in your sandbox. I love that, man. And you got my, my cheeks hurting from smiling so much here. I think you're doing it uh, today. So I appreciate it. A couple more things for you. Um, last question is, what do you do for fun and play that has nothing to do with work? You mentioned motorcycles. Did you end up riding or do you do something else for, for fun? Yeah, you know what? At uh, two or two, three or four years ago, I finally said, you know what? <laughs> Screw this. I went and got my M1 license here in California, and, I, I, and yeah, I, I, I got my motorcycle license. Now, I haven't gotten a motorcycle yet, but I, I passed probably the strongest barrier. The first step, as they say, is the hardest one to take, and yeah, I finally got my motorcycle license. It's a matter of time just to go on down and get the motorcycle. So I don't know now if it's necessarily owning a motorcycle. That might have been the, the barrier, the issue. It was the ability to go ride the motorcycle or make the first move because you can't ride one on the street without a license, is go get the license. And then, you know what? The urge to ride wasn't as great after I got the license. So in my head, that's where I was like, which one was more important? So, uh, but to answer your question, one of the things my wife and I do that we really enjoy is, this, this takes a complete right turn, but that fills my soul, is we work with rescue animals. Uh, we have that. two we, awesome. we have two dogs and both of them are rescues. They're from the rescue that we work with or, or worked in volunteer with a while back. And uh we just enjoy giving back to the community from that sense uh, from, from working with rescue animals. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really cool. And, and I found animals can be playful because they don't have all that head trash around. My mom <laughs> told me I can't have a motorcycle. Exactly. <laughs> right? They just go and play and they, they do their thing, which is, is great. Right. I love that. Uh, yeah. So that brings us to uh, time to play a game. I can't okay. force you to, but would you like to play or, or walk away? What do you think? Nah, let's play brother. Let's play. All right, so I'm spinning the wheel of games. There's 10 games on there. We'll see which one you got. And you are playing awkward questions. Awkward questions. So I have a bunch of awkward questions on my desk. These are like the uh, would you rather questions. So I'll start with um, an easy one here, I think, and just say, what's the most disgusting thing you would eat just for the bragging rights? Uh, have you ever done that or or have you uh, have you thought about um. it? Beer factor challenges. Right. Uh, you know what instantly came to mind is alligator. I don't know why, but uh, yeah, I'd throw some alligator on the plate. I'll probably eat it. Now, there might be people out there that eat it all the time, but me, I never yeah. have. I'll I'll that too. That's a like. good answer. <laughs> um, this answer might also be alligator, but if you could turn one of your friends into an animal for 24 hours, which friend and which animal? Hmm. That's a good creative one. That one's hard. This is uh, <laughs> it's probably be my buddy Robert, and I'd probably change him into 
a wild Mustang. Not just wow. a Mustang, but a wild Mustang. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I could uh, see him in. He needs it. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. That's a really cool answer. I like that. As a married man, I also thought there, there's there got to be something with the wife. You'd have to think about what animal you would. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Just, uh, I don't have a good answer for that one either, but there's probably <laughs> something. That would yeah, work. I'll probably hold off on that one right now. So. <laughs> do you have any children? We do not. We have two, two puppy okay. dogs. That's all we've got. Yeah. Uh, we have two cats. Uh, so this one is a uh, hypothetical then, which is great. If you could choose, uh, to have a child who was ugly and very smart or smart, uh, or very good looking, but kind of stupid, which one would you choose? Mm, I would probably go the ugly and very smart. <laughs> and this sounds crazy, but I think it'd be easier to make the ugly one pretty than make the pretty one smart. This day and age is all kinds of things you can do, man. Uh, and he would be smart enough to, he or she be smart enough to figure that out. Uh, because as much as we don't like to say looks don't matter, looks matter. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes they do. I, I do, and, yeah, and obviously they could uh, do voice acting or something that doesn't yeah, have anything or that. with the looks, right? Yeah. Uh, but um, <laughs> but I yeah, so I think there's lots of ways around that one. The only thing I could see for the other side is that if you're dumb, you of, oftentimes don't realize how bad you have yeah. it, how dumb you are. So you could just live in blissful ignorance. Uh, there. Blissful ignorance, yeah, that's, that's a good, yeah, that's if a good you're option extremely too. Good looking, but <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Uh, all right, well, I appreciate you being on the show. Any ask of the audience, anything we can do to help you or you can do to help us? Um, actually, guys, the only thing I'd ask is if you, you know, you got some time, an hour and a half to spare and you want to be entertained, please go check out Willie's Wonderland here the next weekend or two. And uh, it's on demand pretty much anywhere you can find anything on demand. I think it's HBO Max, uh, Voodoo, uh, Amazon Prime. Uh, but if you just type in Google, uh, where can I stream Willie's Wonderland? It'll pop up somewhere. And it's a, it's a good grab some popcorn with uh, at least the adult family and have some fun. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Definitely looks like uh, fun, a great horror flick there, and a great way to to spend an evening with your uh, your adult family as well. I don't want to forget too many kids there. But uh, you can find Chris at thechriswarner.com too. I'm sure links to uh, all his profiles and other th projects that he has going on. Thechriswarner.com. And check out Willie's Wonderland. For Playful Humans, go to PlayfulHumans.com. There's a quiz there, BuzzFeed-style quiz. Figure out what kind of playful personality you have, and you can join the community. We're collecting other adults who are playful humans and want to have more fun. So join us there and uh, share some ideas how you can play during the pandemic or ideas for future guests, PlayfulHumans.com. Go play, everybody.